comes good afternoon. So, um, and welcome to the Faculty of Health Sciences and to the University of Advarsrand. Um, the University of Advarsrand, as you know, um, prides itself to be a research intensive university. And in many ways, today's function is to celebrate one of those milestones. The Faculty of Health Sciences is also a, um, very active in the research field, um, having published in the region of or just over 1,500 papers out of this faculty last year. We have in the faculty seen a um, near trebling of the number of publications that have come out of this faculty over the last decade. And in fact, the um, research increase or the numbers of or the research um, growth in the university has been 45% in the last five years. Um, from a clinical training perspective, um, WITS has a particularly large platform. We have um, a um, clinical training platform. We, in this faculty, have um, nearly 7,000 students in it, of whom 44% are postgraduate students. We are the biggest trainers of um, specialists in the medical field in this country and also have a large number of subspecialists training in this country. Subspecialists are people who've gone into a specialization such as internal medicine and then have gone on to do something in a smaller field such as pulmonology or cardiology um, and an area in which we particularly are proud of the um, effects and the influence that one of the components of this, faculty, of this faculty has done, namely the Witz Donald Gordon Medical Center. The Witz Donald Gordon Medical Center is a 200 bedded private hospital associated with the uh, faculty in which we have, over the years, trained more than 75 um, registrars and specialists who have rotated throughout our, our whole training platform but have done that at the cost of within the um, faculty, or at least from the, within the Witz Donald Gordon Medical Center. Um, as you know, um, Witz does work very closely with a number of other partners, particularly the Provincial ha Department of Health, the Gauteng Department of Health, and the um, NHLS, the National Health Laboratory Services, as well as with the NICD, and many of these people have been partners in the work that we're um, announcing today. Finally, I'd like to just mention that today is Witz's 96th birthday, and um, we're looking forward to getting to the point where we are centenarians, um, but I think that, in, in fact, even looking at it today, um, a remarkable history that this university has gone through to be at the, in a position for instance, to be able to talk about the kind of work that we're doing today. So again, welcome. Um, as was mentioned, Professor Zeblon Villakazi, the DVC for research in the university, will be joining us later, as will our um, Vice-Chancellor, um, Professor um, Adam Habib. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. We'd like to call on Dr. Susan Tager, who is the CEO of its Donald Gordon Medical Center, to speak to us for a few minutes. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, June. The Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Aaron Motswaledi, Professor Vela, colleagues, media. Um, I would like to just take a moment to set the scene before we get to the heart of the matter today. But what you will hear about from my colleagues today is a story that is all about bravery, brave decisions, difficult decisions, finding solutions for impossible situations, and most of all, collaboration. And I think that is the essence also of the facility in which this amazing work has happened, and that is the Witz Donald Gordon Medical Center. As Professor Vela has said, this is a private academic hospital, the first and only of its kind in South Africa, that came about as a result of vision um, and uh, trying to address problems um, and, and foreseeing problems and, and addressing them in an innovative way. So we were established for the purpose of training doctors in collaboration with the public sector, and that is what we've done. And um, 16 years later, we have a thriving hospital that generates money for the sole purpose 
of reinvesting it in training. While we're located in the private sector, we function essentially as a not-for-profit hospital, and our collaboration with the university, with the private hospital sector in the form of our partner MediClinic, with the public sector, and with the various departments that Martin has mentioned, has allowed us to establish a transplant unit that provides access to all South Africans requiring <coughs> liver transplantation, and has provided a platform where this kind of innovative work can take place. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. We're going to move on now. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Professor Jean Boerta, who is the principal investigator of the study, and he's also the head of transplantation at WITS, associated with the University of Advertisement's Department of Surgery. Jean is going to explain to us what has happened. He will be followed by Dr. Harriet Etheridge, who is a medical bioethicist and has been critical in us negotiating the ethical issues that have been a, the crux and part of this case. We also have with us Professor Caroline Timerson from the NICD at WITS. And Caroline is a virologist. She has many hats. She's also an immunologist. And she's a basic scientist with a very specific focus on the science of HIV vaccines and HIV cure. And Caroline has played a fundamental role with her expert team at the NICD in trying to help us understand the HIV science of this case, which she will explain to us. And finally, we have Dr. Francesca Conradi. And Francesca is an HIV clinician from the Department of Internal Medicine at WITS. And she's very experienced, having worked in HIV research and treatment for the last 20 years. So, Jean, we'll start with you. Thanks, June. <clears throat> the Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Aaron Mazzaledi, Professor Vela, media colleagues. I'm really quite privileged to be standing here. I'm uh, just a small part of a large team of really incredible uh, individuals who uh, every day go to work and make organ transplantation a reality for the people of this country. So this story uh, is to my mind, an inspirational one, and that's why we're here. This is a case of a life-saving liver transplant from an HIV-positive mother to her HIV-negative child. To our, the best of our knowledge, this is the first liver transplant of its kind in the world. So two aspects of this case are unique in my mind. Firstly, it involved the living donation of an organ from an HIV-positive individual. And secondly, the recipient received a triple uh, antiretroviral prophylaxis and may have actually potentially prevented the transmission of HIV. This we will only know in time, however. How we got to this point uh, requires a brief history of HIV and transplantation in South Africa. In our WITS transplant program, the past five years has seen an exponential growth, a uh, huge increase in number of children uh, on our transplant waiting list. This may be partially due to increased awareness and a better referral process, but also to the fact that uh, liver transplantation has been made accessible to all children needing this form of therapy, regardless of their payer status. And this has been made possible through collaboration uh, with the Department of Health and with Witts Donald Gordon Medical Center. Unfortunately, the availability of organs, however, has not kept pace with this growing demand. And sadly, this results in children dying while waiting for these life-saving organs. For children with liver failure, the only option for treatment mostly is a liver transplant. For this to happen, an organ can be sourced from deceased donors, but because of the shortage, as mentioned, this makes it very difficult for us to acquire organs for these recipients. So this critical shortage necessitates exploration of alternatives for our patients. And in an attempt to address this, uh, this problem, we established a living donor liver transplant program at WITS in 2013. We did this with the assistance of colleagues uh, from the University of Nebraska in Omaha in the United States. It's also important to point out that this is the only such program in the entire sub-Saharan Africa. 
To explain a little bit how this works, uh, we would take a portion uh, of liver from a healthy uh, adult. Uh, in this instance, it's usually a parent. Uh, and this is then transplanted, this portion is then transplanted into the child with liver failure. As the child grows, the liver grows with it and ensures that the child remains healthy. For the donor, the beauty of it is that the liver will also regenerate and within a period of about six to eight weeks, this liver regenerates back to its original number of cells. So the donor is hopefully not compromised. Around the same time that we started this living donor liver transplant program at WITS, uh, our colleagues at the University of Cape Town, motivated by similar organ shortages and a lack of dialysis access for kidney failure patients, started transplanting organs from HIV positive deceased donors into HIV positive kidney recipients. And they had very good results. Based on the success of this program, the HIV Organ Policy Equity, or HOPE Act, was signed into law in the United States in 2015. Prior to this, it was illegal in the United States to transplant organs from an HIV positive person. While South Africa has one of the highest global prevalences of HIV, we also have by far the largest treatment program in the world, with thanks to the efforts and commitment of the government. In concert with the success of the prevention of mother to child transmission, this has now resulted in a population of young adults living with well-controlled HIV who have HIV negative children. It is these parents who presented our center with their children in liver failure who have challenged us as to why being HIV positive excludes them from being able to save the lives of their children. This then raised the question for us. So do we consider transplanting HIV positive organs into HIV negative recipients? As with most decisions, this comes down to understanding the potential risks and benefits in this instance for both donor and recipient. Our patient was becoming increasingly ill uh, while on the waiting list with a couple of admissions to hospital for life-threatening complications of end-stage liver disease. Without transplant, this child would certainly have died. However, saving the life of the child needed to be balanced against the risk that we would almost certainly infect the child uh, with HIV if the mom was to be the donor. For the mother, quantification of risk was a lot simpler. She had been on antiretroviral therapy for longer than six months, had a CD4 count greater than 200, and an undetectable viral load, making the operation of donation for her equivalent to that of an HIV-negative living donor. These risks, and these risks and benefits for both donor and recipient were carefully thought through by our team, and ultimately we presented it to the WITS Human Research Ethics Committee, who granted us approval to proceed. After more than one year follow-up now, the child, still on antiretroviral therapy, is thriving, and the mom is very well. While the child has seroconverted, the antibody response has now waned over this year to almost undetectable levels. In addition, at no time point since the surgery have we been able to demonstrate either HIV, DNA, or RNA in the plasma or serum of the child. So currently the child's HIV status is equivocal. And in time, the only way to definitively establish this may be having to stop the antiretroviral therapy. Further insights and research uh, into this, I think, will inform our decision as to when the right time is to do that. So the need for, organ transplant for organs for transplantation is high and is presently unmatched by the availability of donor organs, as I said, resulting in several deaths on the waiting list. This growing need, coupled with the knowledge that people with HIV can live a long and normal life on antiretroviral therapy, as well as the lessons that we have now learned from this case, opens up another potential therapeutic option for those in need of life-saving organ transplants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. Harriet, would you like to take the floor? Good afternoon. It is afternoon now. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I did a lot of the ethics work on this case, and I'm just going to briefly talk over some of the main points, um, four main ones. Firstly, I would like to emphasize that confidentiality in this case is absolutely paramount. We are not at liberty to divulge any personal details of the family in this case, and we have no video footage of the transplant for confidentiality reasons. We would really appreciate it if this request could be respected. 
For us in deciding to go ahead and do this transplant, it was really important that we looked at this option from every possible angle and that we had full institutional support from Wits University. By the time we actually transplanted this child in 2017, the child had been on our waiting list for a deceased donor liver for almost three times the average. So the window that we had to transplant this child and to save the child's life was closing fast. And we were compelled to consider options that we wouldn't have considered before. One of those options was to give this child an HIV-positive liver segment donated by the child's HIV-positive mother. This was not a decision we took lightly. We consulted far and wide, locally and internationally, with transplant surgeons, HIV clinicians, pediatricians, ethicists, and lawyers. And ultimately, we got approval to do this procedure from our medical ethics committee here at WITS. And one of the main functions of this committee is to protect patients in medical research. And that, for us, was also a paramount consideration. The second ethical issue that challenged us was the uncertainty around this case. Because this case had not been done before, we didn't really have the knowledge to quantify the risk of the child contracting HIV from the transplant. To further complicate matters, we had a child who was too young to make a decision for themselves. We had a child who was not in a position to tell us whether they were willing to live HIV positive. Ultimately, we decided to go ahead, and we hope that through making this decision and through saving this child's life, we have now put this child in a position to make their own decisions going forward. The final ethical issue I want to briefly touch on is that parents will often stop at nothing to save the lives of their children. And I'm sure those of you in this audience who have kids will sympathize with what I'm saying. This is a phenomenon we see in transplant internationally, and it has been well-researched. Anywhere in the world where you have a child who needs a kidney or a liver transplant, you often have a parent who is there, who is willing to be a living donor, and who is willing to undergo a risky procedure in order to make this happen. What we can do in this case is make sure that parents are completely familiarized with the risk which they face. We had an independent donor advocate to assist us in this case, and the role of this person is basically to support the parents in making their decision to really walk the path with the parents, and also to make representations to us on behalf of the parent if they feel we need any more information. So ultimately, what we had here was a really brave set of parents making a difficult decision, and their decision has not only resulted in saving the life of their child, but has also opened up extensive new options for HIV research in South Africa, and has hopefully opened up a new living liver donor pool for kids in South Africa who are HIV negative, but who have end-stage liver failure. Thank you. Thanks very much, Harriet. Caroline, Thank if you, you can go into the science, which is really hard, but hopefully you'll make it simple for us. Great, thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to summarize and try and take you through the results of the tests that were done to determine the HIV infection status of the child. So the child we know was HIV antibody negative before transplantation. So this means that the child was not being born to an HIV infection, had not become infected uh, through mother-to-child transmission at an earlier time. Um, the mother, as you've heard, was on triple drug therapy during pregnancy, and then the child also received standard treatment to prevent mother-to-child transmission, which is six weeks of uh, single-dose uh, nivirapine daily. At the time of the transplant, the child was 13 months of age. Uh, we also know that the mother was well suppressed on her treatment, and both the mom and the child remain on treatment. The child also received 
um, sorry, before, um, uh, at the time, just before, the night before the transplant, the child received triple drug therapy. The child, in addition to being on antiretrovirals, remains on immunosuppressive treatment uh, that is required in order to avoid um, organ um, rejection. So after HIV transplantation, the HIV status of the child was monitored by standard tests. These are standard diagnostic tests. At no time have we ever detected virus, not by detection of viral load in the blood or within the cells um, of, um, by standard HIV PCR tests, and also not with an ultra-sensitive, a very sensitive method for detecting the po possible traces of HIV DNA within cells. So that would be partly measuring the virus actually integrating into cells. Therefore, we haven't found any direct evidence of virus, not in the blood and not in blood cells. Because we can't detect the virus, we must keep in mind, it doesn't mean that it's not there in some very, very small amount that we cannot detect with the sensitivity of our methods. But one thing that we did see, at 43 days post-transplant, the child became HIV antibody positive. The amounts of this antibody then started waning over the next several months, and then were virtually undetectable by a year. And I'm sure if we test at another time point, we will find that this is now HIV antibody negative. So normally when you detect an HIV, anti you get an HIV antibody test, you will be considered as HIV positive. However, we are being cautious about our interpretation of this result. Because the setting is so different, it's different to anything we've ever encountered, and we need to maybe um, review that from a, from a research perspective. This particular result has raised a number of questions for us. The child may well be HIV uh, positive, and that this test and this anti antibody positive test indicates HIV infection. It is also possible that this the response that we're seeing is actually the child response clearing um, virus or virus infected cells from the liver, and that over time this wanes. The other possibility is that this response may not be the child's response at all. It may well be the mother's antibody response. And I say that because the liver has got a lot of immune cells that are the mother's cells. The mother obviously has encountered HIV, has memory responses, immune responses that actually respond to HIV. So it is perfectly plausible that that response may well also be cells that are producing antibody that is not actually the child actively responding to virus. So from a research perspective, these are some of the questions we'd like to address going forward. And how we're going to do this is we hope to be conducting further transplants of this nature as part of an approved research study. Um, we will also do more detailed studies in further cases and also try and follow patients pre-transplant and then after the transplant. We need to have a better understanding of this very novel type of transmission because it is unprecedented. Nothing like this has been done before, so that we can in future inform best practice in the setting of this liver donor um, HIV positive program. Thank you. Thanks so much, Caroline. <laughs> I think that's a really good job of making something quite hard and complicated <laughs> accessible, so thank you very much. Francesca, over to you as the HIV clinician on the ground. Thank you very much. So in my career, HIV infection has been transformed from an invariably fatal disease to a chronic manageable condition. For most HIV-infected people who live within the borders of South Africa, one pill once a day is all that it takes to halt and reverse the progression of the disease, with minimal side effects and the medicines are improving all the time. We also have to bear in mind that HIV, although there's been much improvement over time, has become a stigmatized uh, disease, largely because, I believe, of the way it which, in which it is transmitted. From research, we also know ways in which we can prevent HIV transmission. The first one is that we know that if we put pa patients onto antiretroviral therapy, it reduces the viral load the number of viral particles in the bloodstream, and renders such individuals almost non-infectious. Although we had no evidence that this would happen if we transplanted a solid organ. 
In addition to the use of antiretroviral therapy to people who are HIV infected, we sometimes use it in people who are HIV uninfected but are exposed. Some examples of this is when uh, healthcare workers get needle stick injuries from someone who's HIV infected, we give them post-exposure prophylaxis. The same applies to survivors of sexual assault. And this dramatically decreases the amount of transmission that occurs. This is called post-exposure prophylaxis. So with all this in mind, I spent uh, time explaining this to the mother of the baby. She was well aware of how sick her child was. You didn't have to be a doctor to be able to see that. And she could see that her child was deteriorating every day. The mother had been on successful antiretroviral anti therapy for quite a while, had a normal CD4 count and an undetectable viral load. She was well, as most people are who live within our borders and are on successful antiretroviral therapy. On the night before the transplant, the baby was started on antiretroviral therapy. We used three medicines, as is the standard. And this is the best that we knew on how to prevent infection. I'm not a transplant surgeon, but the transplant went exceptionally well. And since then, this little one has thrived. Her new liver is functioning well. She remains on antiretroviral therapy as we are in uncharted water and is tolerating, uh, the child is tolerating her anti-rejection medicine very well. We are not sure if we're going to stop the child's antiretroviral therapy, and I'm doing this in consultation with other scientists. Um, but at this stage, we have saved the, the life of a child. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesca. We'd like to now ask the Honourable Minister of Health, Dr. Erin Matsuledi, to address us. a procedure which up to so far we regard as the first of the world. We do undermine ourselves as South Africa and whenever we have got hardships, we forget about all these achievements. We have already forgotten that the first heart transplant ever in the world happened in this country. So this is the first liver transplant of its own kind ever in the country. So we must sometimes, even through our difficulties, pat ourselves in the back. I am sure the explanations here by scientists are still very difficult for some of us to understand. The viral load, the viral load suppression, the antibodies not being from the baby, from the mother, and all that. It's, it's a very difficult, complex thing to understand, but let's try to simplify it. To me, what has happened here is coming together of maturing systems, which people might have thought are not related. Firstly, only a decade ago, 
HIV positive people, at least most of them, were a death sentence already. And you remember we launched what is now the world's biggest HIV antiretroviral program, I mean to say, the biggest in the whole world. We might be undermining it. It is now maturing to an extent where it produces virally suppressed individuals, people who will remain HIV positive but are, are virally suppressed. And this mother was one of those. She was virally suppressed. And uh, you might un understand that in 2014, the International AIDS Society Conference held in Melbourne in Australia agreed on the concept of 1990-90 to bring an end to HIV AIDS. And we have got a dream that will achieve that 1990-90 by 2030. You, you remember the two 90s about finding people who are HIV positive and putting 90% of them on treatment, but the last 90 is what interests us, virally suppressed. This mother is one of those. Can we imagine if 90% of the HIV positive population are now virally suppressed, that is the first system. The second system that has come to maturity is the success of our PMTCT program, prevention of mother to child transmission. We might also forget where we started from. Only a decade and a half ago, by 2004, 70,000 babies were born HIV positive every year in South Africa at that time. But through our concerted PMTCT program, that figure has dropped to less than 4,000. We now can dream that in a few years' time, we might actually follow countries like Cuba to become a country where no more children are born HIV positive. So that success of the PMTCT program has produced this baby. The baby was born HIV negative because of the PMCT problem, program. Now the second question was, can this baby be saved by the liver from the mother? And I'm sure maybe what has not been explained, if I'm not mistaken, maybe I didn't hear it, is that the baby's liver problem did not stem from HIV. The, the baby has biliary atresia. It was another, am I correct? Yes, I don't want to, yes. The baby has biliary atresia, meaning the, the, the vessels inside the liver, the biliary vessels were very narrow, or, or some of them not opening, and that led to liver uh, failure. Now, can we imagine if this happened 10 years ago, when we did not have this world biggest antiretroviral therapy, when we did not have any successful PMTCT, it was a left death sentence, by the way, for both mother and the baby. This baby will not have survived. That's why I'm saying it's a meeting of maturing systems. Now it means our HIV AIDS program in the, in the country has not only increased life expectancy, but it's starting to make people live normal lives live lives which me and you will have lived. Yes, 10 years ago, if it was my child who had biliary atresia and, and the mother who would have been HIV negative, it wouldn't have been an issue for us. Now, it was an issue for these people, for this couple, if the incidents happened 10 years ago. But it's no longer an issue because the two systems are maturing. So, what does it mean? It's now opening new policy discussions, which I suspect are going to start from here, and our scientists must be ready. Especially, yes, those who deal with bioethics, those who deal with HIV, clinician society, uh, uh, Dr. Conradi and, and, and colleagues and all that, there's going to be a policy issue, policy issue put in front of you. Are HIV positive people allowed to donate organs? That's, that's the question that's going to be asked. I've already asked that 
question in the morning, and it's going to be out in the public. And uh, you are going to have to explain. I don't want to take over the job of explaining it because I might mess up, but that's what I'm going to be asked for. That minister, there's, there's been a groundbreaking research at Vets University. Does it allow us who are HIV positive to start donating organs? Can I start donating a kidney to my sibling or my spouse or whoever I'm close to or even to a friend? When I'm waiting for a heart transplant, and the next heart transplant that becomes available is from an HIV positive patient. Can I get that heart? So this is opening all those discussions. Maybe we might start shedding some light on some of them. In other words, I'm already asking questions for the media even before they start asking. <laughs> yes, because I know many of them will be thinking that direction. But anyway, uh, we are very happy uh, to be part of this exercise and that the train blazing took place in our own country. Thank you very much, and once more, congratulations. I hope the country will celebrate this. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Those very kind and inspiring words. So now we'd like to proceed with the Q&A for the press. How we would like to do it is take three questions and then I will direct them to the members of the panel to answer them. So if we could start with that, that would be great. And can I tell the press that they must pretend I'm also a scientist today? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem, we'll add you in. <laughs> Are there any questions? Hmm. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Masiko from ENCA. Mine is just a question of clarity. I just I just uh, one wanted to find out, so the, the, the child was 13 months old at the time of the surgery. Is the child a he or she? Are we allowed to say whether the child is a he or she, number one? And um, I believe you said it's been a year since the surgery happened. So my questions are basically just for clarity. Harriet, would you like to answer that? I think you did address it, but... Uh, yes, thank you, June. Um, yes, our paper that we have published in the AIDS journal that you'll be able to access does state that the child was 13 months old. We are not at liberty to divulge any other personal details of the family. And yes, it is a year post, if that was your other question. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Back. Hi, my name is Catherine Child. I'm from Times Live and Sunday Times. Also, just a question of clarity. Is the fact the child's on ALVs, could that also be making the virus not show up? Is it also a confounding factor to why you don't know the child's status? Thanks, Catherine. Are there any other questions we can field? Otherwise, I'll ask Caroline to answer. Yes. Hi. Um, um, hi, I'm from Becca Sisa at the Mail and Guardian. Um, I just wanted to know, in terms of um, as the child grows up, what kind of things will you be looking to sort of monitor and what, if anything, can it tell us about like reservoirs and um, maybe feeding into cure research? Thanks. Um, so, sorry. Yes. Oh, um, Bob Madrilana from EWN. Um, Minister, you said something about this could change policy in how you look at people that HIV donating organs being allowed. The, yeah, um, sorry. Oh, the plan, I can't just, see me. Yeah. Does that mean there's also already a process which you're discussing how you could look into that or you're just saying into the future? That's what you're looking at. Thank you. Okay, so Caroline, would you address the first question, please, um, which was relating to does the fact that this child is on ALVs affect how we can detect? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the presence of antiretrovirals definitely can suppress the virus to undetectable levels. Um, however, the, the possibility of the more sensitive method that we use when we detect HIV DNA in cells, um, we would think that if there's a small amount, we should be able to detect it. If I can just compare it to another example. Um, so, for example, the South African child that was uh, reported last year, um, the child that's still in remission, 
Um, there, if we look for virus in the child cells, we very readily can detect it. So we can see that the virus is there, the DNA in the integrated form is sitting in the cells, yet when we look at the virus load, that remains suppressed. Um, there we think of small numbers of particles may be produced in the child, um, but um, there we can readily detect. So, uh, but yes, I mean, obviously we have to keep in mind that your antiretrovirals are keeping the virus down, and that can certainly affects your ability to detect and it certainly affects the diagnostic assays. Thanks, Caroline. Francesca, would you... The reason. Yeah, Francesca, would you be able to address the issue of when we stop? How does that... How do we make that decision? When would we decide how much time is enough time to leave the child on treatment? Uh, I think the answer to that, unfortunately, is we're not sure yet. Um, we, I have discussed this case widely with pediatricians in South Africa and at the moment the child is tolerating the medicines well. There are no problems with the swallowing of the medicines. Perhaps in a year or so's time, but I don't want to, I, I'm not sure. As the child is well, we're just leaving it the way it is. Caroline, is there something you'd like to add? Sorry, I think in answer to your question about uh, what sort of research one would do in the, in the sort of HIV cure arena. Um, so we realise that obviously in the whole HIV cure field, something that's lacking is information on the virus reservoir in different organs. Um, so obviously we need to understand the virus reservoir in the liver um, and try and have a, have a better understanding of that. That we can do through indirect. We can't. We obviously cannot work on an individual um, and take biopsies whenever you want. But um, we need to be working on either limits of cadavers to try and understand that reservoir uh, more closely. I think something that's very interesting about the liver is because it really is a unique organ. Um, and I think some of the studies that have been done in, in monkeys I think it's also quite promising for the fact that maybe it doesn't serve as a reservoir of highly productive um, HIV. Um, it does serve in, the, in, in terms of clearance of virus, so the liver, part of its action is to actually, um, it's got cells that will take up particles, that will take up infected dying cells and actually get rid of them. So their role, the role of the liver is to destroy cells like that and to destroy virus. So you will have virus trafficking in um, and, and being caught up in the liver. Whether that's viable or not um, is the question. There are studies that do show, um, and there's in a particular, um, a very convincing study done in monkeys, where they looked at the, whether there was productive infection, if cells are productively infected and actually producing virus in the liver. And they looked at about 42 monkeys, all but one monkey, showed productively infected um, um, cells, and this is untreated, so there's no, there are no drugs on board. Um, while when they looked in various other organs, they found very high amounts of cells producing virus. So it's some of those studies that we can try and draw on, and I think we need to watch the literature. We also need to really direct studies looking at the virus as a reservoir for HIV um, and in other contexts, and follow over time. Um, um, and I think maybe that will help us um, to determine whether it is safe for us to stop treatment at any stage. Again, that would then fall in the arena of it's, it's purely a research um, a question, and that would have to be considered, and, and, mo and, the, and the child would have to be monitored very, very carefully in, in that setting. Thanks, Caroline. I think we're going to be keeping your expert team at the NRCD very busy with <laughs> this research. Um, honest, question, Honourable right? Minister, now that you, we've, been adopt, we've adopted you as a scientific member of the panel, would you like to answer the next question that was directed at you? Yeah, it, it's a question about policy. Yes, I, I've just said it, it means it's a starting of a policy. We can't avoid it. Mm -hmm. It will start, but into the future, people are going to be asking. And by the way, I already saw it coming. Before the press conference, I did ask the scientists, and I already have a fairer idea of how the discussion will go. For, for instance, they have done it to the liver. It might not be easy for a kidney, because mm -hmm. there are very different organs. Livers uh, regenerate and kidneys don't. 
So the question is, if you are HIV positive, can we allow you to donate the kidney to somebody and remain which one with, which can get complications? I ask the same thing about the heart, but the summary of it is that it is the beginning of a debate about a new policy approach, mm. but still very, very early on. Mm. I was just trying to show that that debate must now start. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, my question really is about really taking it back to you talking about maturing systems and that people are on HIV medicines and ARVs. Could you just talk about our collapsing systems um, when people aren't able to access ARVs? And we know that Muffa King in the Northwest is going through a crisis right now. Could you talk a little bit to that if we're really trying to make an impact on something that is as trailblazing and, as, and something worth celebrating that? has brought us together here today. Are there any other questions before we direct that question to the Minister? Yes, Maseko? Yeah. Anyone? I just uh, wanted to ask the Minister or any other doctors uh, on the table, um, just about the, 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 I know that we've done this before, it's, it's a plea that has been done by medical school after medical school, even the Minister himself, just about uh, this obviously being a positive thing to encourage people to uh, donate uh, their organs, uh, you know, families also to agree to deceased uh, family members to also be a part of donating uh, to save a life, just uh, with regards to that. Thank you. One other question? Catherine? Hi. Um just a question without giving away anything about the family or the identity. Is there a reason you decided to do this now? Was there something about the child or the mom? Like, there have obviously been HIV positive people who have organs before and negative people dying. So, is there any reason why you did it now? Was the science just advanced enough? Did the mom ask for it? Jean, do you want to answer that? Let's start with Catherine's answer and Jean, and then Jean, maybe you can also address the encouragement to ask people to donate. Okay, thank you. Um, the first part, we, for this particular child, we were losing a window of opportunity. Uh, the child was deteriorating and we had to transplant this child to save its life. And so it wasn't really about... Uh, uh, maturing um, uh, technology or anything like that. We had everything available to do, living donor liver transplant. The program was up and running. But HIV positive donors were, were at that point in time excluded from being donors because of the risk of transmitting uh, the disease. Uh, and it was the family that, that pushed us and asked the difficult questions. Why exclude me just because I'm HIV positive? Uh, and that is what forced us to think hard about this and to ask widely, uh, is this possible, can we do it? So really it was about a window of opportunity closing for this, uh, this baby and a family that were brave enough to continue pushing us and asking, why are you excluding us? Mm. And in terms of the confidentiality, Harriet, I don't know if you want to address that? Um, is my mic on? Yes. Um, so the confidentiality in this case is paramount because this is the first case and because of our numbers it's very important that we maintain the confidentiality. Um, can I also say something about encouraging organ donation? Um, um, Harriet, just to add, was it not an expressed request mm. from the family to mm. remain uh, to remain to confidential the confidentiality. Yeah. was that yeah. not also a component yeah that was definitely a component and we would consider that as a component of all medical interventions in south africa um, in terms of encouraging organ donation i think that what's really interesting in this case is that organs from deceased donors are one of the main donor pools and in South Africa, we face a really severe shortage of deceased donor organs. And it's from that shortage that stems this need to find alternatives for patients who have end-stage disease, because without these alternatives, these patients are going to die. So we would always 
like to encourage as far as possible people in deceased organ donation, and John can elaborate on that. And I think just from myself as a bioethicist, one of the main messages and what seems not to happen in organ donation is that people would like to be organ donors, but they don't tell their family that that is their preference. And we need families to know that that is the patient's preference because the family ultimately will be making the decision for the patient. And I'm sure that you have something to add there. In terms of the organ donation and the rest of it, clearly we've got a critical shortage that, that we all know. But what do we do? How do we think outside the box? How do we try and uh, increase this? And we've seen countries in Europe now uh, move to what is known as, a, as an opt-out system, where you are a presumed donor unless you opt out. So it becomes the law of the country that everybody, uh, what, when they declared brain dead or are considered as a, a suitable organ donor, are presumed to be a donor unless they have prior to their death signed something or documented something that opts out of that system. It's time for us in this country to start having that difficult discussion uh, about an opt-out system uh, of almost presumed consent. And I think we have, we, and we have to be empathetic to uh, the different backgrounds of everybody, the different religio religious classes, um, and understand where the context of it before we start doing this. But we really have to start having that difficult discussion about something like an opt-out system. Thank you, Jean. Minister, you might want to add in, but also if you could address the question to you about maturing the systems and access to ARVs. Yes. Uh, actually, the question was about collapsing system. <laughs> on, yes, I think it's I a I chose maturing. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I think it's a very important but also brilliant question that needs to be responded to. But I think the trouble we are faced with is our inability to somehow celebrate our successes versus our over-eagerness to always project our failures as defining everything that we're doing. It is very painful, of course, for any one individual to go to a clinic and not find medication. As it happened in Northwest and we had in Limpop, it's very painful. But it does not mean the collapse of the antiretroviral program in the world. It still remains the biggest in the world. There are four million people on it. You could be in that clinic, maybe they are treating 500 people, maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000 who don't get ARVs that week is a very painful thing, it's unacceptable. But remember, we have got four million people, and I'm not saying the others are not important, they are. So, so it does not necessarily relate into the collapse of that system, because if it was, number one, life expectancy would not have increased steadily by one year over the past eight years. It has, I'm sure you know, that life expectancy when we started was somewhere around 56% is now 64%. One year of life expectancy every year, every, every year for the past eight years. The second thing, our maternal mortality. You are aware that maternal mortality has drastically dropped in South Africa because 50% of maternal mortality was related to HIV. But because of the, our, the, the antiretroviral program, Maternal mortality has dramatically dropped, and that way dramatic was used by UNAIDS, not us. The under five mortality has also dropped because 50% of it was HIV. Opportunistic diseases like cryptococcus, meningitis, etc., are not seen as often as it was a decade ago, and I'm sure the clinicians here can support me on that. Uh, commonly seen people dying of pneumonia, Cryptococcal meningitis, all this have, have changed, but people <coughs> tend to undermine them when they hear a story over the radio of somebody who went to a clinic and find no medicines. And I emphasize that is unacceptable, we'll try to solve it. <coughs> but it does not detract from the fact that we have got maturing system that are starting to produce results. And I gave you an example. How did we arrive at a situation where 
we move from 70,000 babies born HIV positive every year to less than 4,000. If the system was completely collapsed, how did we arrive there? By what mechanism? And lastly, only a few months ago, the Human Science Research Council released uh, their study results about the HIV prevalence survey, which they do every five years. And we have seen that there's been a tremendous improvement from the last study which they produced in 2012 to now about the results. Even reporting that on the 1990-90, we are at 86, 85, 80, 86, meaning the viral suppression is increasing. And uh, that uh, even the, 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 the incidence of HIV AIDS in certain age groups have dropped because of the antiretroviral therapy. So I'm just saying, when you look at those failures we have quoted, like we have quoted in Northwest, but do understand that they also produce results. And we believe within a very short space of time, we will, of course, resolve the failures. I mean, one of them is only in 2004, we have 400,000 people who are on ARVs. Today, we have got 4.2 million who are on ARVs using the same health facilities. We have not even doubled the number of our clinics and hospitals. We haven't doubled the number of doctors, but we've increased tenfold the number of people who are on treatment. Surely such a big system will have to have uh, problems within it. And the important thing is, are we able to solve those problems or not? Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Are there any other questions? Yes. Hi, I'm William Kizer here from City Press Newspaper. Um, I just want to know, you know, after various testing has been done, the follow-up tests, um, I suppose the question is um, really about if the child does become HIV positive, does this have impact on future cases or what are your concerns around that? I mean, what are your fears if the child does um, have HIV? Any other questions on the floor before we ask someone to respond? John, are you taking that one? Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Our presumption going into this was that the child would develop HIV, uh, and that was the ethical debate. Could we balance the risk of uh, saving the child's life against the risk of developing, the benefits rather of saving the child's life against the risk of developing HIV. We have so much information now that we've heard and we know that people live a long, healthy life on antiretroviral therapy. We were thinking or hoping that even if the child develops HIV afterwards, that we've given this child the opportunity to live a normal, healthy childhood, adolescence, and into early adulthood, and be able to make the decisions for itself that it can regarding that disease. Francesca, would you like to add anything? Maybe. Oh. No, after you. <laughs> yes. Uh, maybe I should state, if, if this is a fear, that uh, people should understand, society should understand that science and medicine does not necessarily have all the answers, mm -hmm. but we try our best under the circumstances. And sometimes there are choices to make. It's not for the first, in this case, it would not have been for the first time that bioethicists are faced with an ethical dilemma. Last week in New York, we were discussing it, and uh, we have just found a solution for it, which is new. Not in the case of HIV, in the case of multidrug resistant TB, <coughs> where we give an example of how people have to treat their hearing. Mm. That's just their life. Mm. Yes. When people have got multidrug resistant TB, we give them canamycin, you know, an injection every day for 18 months, every single day. And, and you endure that trauma, but at the same time, you lose your hearing completely. But at least you are alive. Now, in New York, one of the girls who was speaking, a 17-year-old girl from India, uh, got a standing ovation, but also red eyes you know, from the audience, because it was emotional. When she was talking about her fight with drug resistant TB, where doctors agreed to give her the canamycin, and she totally lost her hearing, completely. And she said, look, I can't hear you, 
but you can hear me at least, mm -hmm. and you'll move to help people like myself. Now, it has been for a long time that that drug has been used, but with advances of science, we, we now have Peter Willen. And I announced in July in Amsterdam that South Africa negotiated a cheaper price from Pitaguli from $900 to $400. Meaning what? People no longer have to be poked every day for 18 months. Mm -hmm. They no longer have to lose their, their hearing. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, those who are alive had to lose their hearing because there was no other thing. So we are hoping with the field of HIV to advance, this child will have died of biliary atresia but he's alive, and if he's HIV positive, he'll live like all the other people who are HIV positive, who live for 20 years, 80 years, etc. And that to me is a very good choice. But to believe that scientists could have maybe got all the answers which are perfect and 100%, uh, that's not what life is made of. Yes, that's not what the life we are living at the present moment is made of. So we do make the choices, and as far as I'm concerned, I believe this was the best choice ever that the scientists made. Thank you very much. Francesca, would you like to add something? So in medical science, all the time, we accumulate new evidence. And we have very strict rules about how we rate the evidence. If we're faced with the same situation again, we will be able to give a little bit more information to the families of such a child. When we have 10 case series, we will have more evidence. doesn't mean that we don't know what we're doing. It just means that we are accumulating more evidence to give people informed uh, information as to make their own health-seeking choices. Thank you. Very succinctly summarized, Francesca. Are there any other questions from the press they would like to be addressed? And maybe just to, yes. to add yes. one more thing, sorry. Yes. We, we do have a young lady who we usually call to press conference when we discuss this issue of multi-drug resistant TB in Kailicha, who was treated for four years. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, had to swallow 20,000 tablets in those four mm -hmm. years. She was totally deaf. Today she can hear she has got a, a cochlear transplant. Mm -hmm. If the doctors didn't decide there that we are giving this young girl canamycin, she's going to become totally blind. If they said, no, we're not giving her, she would have died. Mm. She wouldn't even have a chance to get this cochlear transplant, which has now restored the hearing. What will happen if maybe, maybe, just maybe, because researchers are researching, maybe if a cure for HIV AIDS is found within the next few years and this child benefits from it. If this operation will not, was not done, we would have died. We wouldn't even wait to come and benefit from there. What if scientists discover a vaccine? So we must always consider those things when we make these decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. If there are no more questions, we'd like to close this conference today. And if we could ask our um, Professor Zeblon Bilakazi, who is our Deputy BC for Research, to take the floor. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh. Thank you, Prof. Mm, he's awesome. My name is Evan Blagazi. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Postgraduate Affairs. And um, here, just to share a few reflections from the university and send apologies for being late and for the absence of the Vice Chancellor, Minister, who is held up somewhere. Um, this is a great moment for the university uh, to uh, showcase the excellence and groundbreaking work that our researchers have uh, concluded today. Um, before I give a of thanks, I'd just like to make a few reflections of the university's strategy that we do believe that for us to address these issues, appropriate funding and ensuring that we safeguard the research intensive universities. Because if it wasn't for the investment that you made over the, over the years and how the country responded to this burden of HIV, of, of, of HIV AIDS and the appropriate resources from all departments, Department of Health, Science and Technology, and many others would have made this progress you've made in South Africa over the last 
many years. So I'd like to thank the Honourable Minister of Health, Dr. Aaron Muzwini, for being present today and for guiding us and even opening up new vistas of potential evidence-based questions that can uh, unleash new possibilities and influence policy going forward. And I think you've worked this journey with us since you took the challenge with great gumption when you were appointed minister almost 10 years ago. I'd also like to congratulate the team. Um, also, you know, congratulate Professor Simonson, who last year, by the way, was recognized by the university as one of the copies with the Vice Chancellor's Research Award. So the university was aware it anticipated in advance this groundbreaking work. So I ensure that it off today. And Francesca Jean and the team, congratulations as well. We'd like to thank the mother and child for partnering with this university and partners in this very serious and groundbreaking project. I'd like to congratulate and thank the Transplant Unit and its leadership at the Vets Donald Gordon Medical Center and the Faculty of Health Sciences. Our thanks and congratulations go, go to the Dean, the Head of Department, and a team of research ex excellent researchers who supported and led this, pro this groundbreaking project. The National Institute for Communic Communicable Disease and partners from the University of Pretoria for participating in the study. I'd like to thank, on behalf of the university, the media, most importantly, for covering this sensitive research with, in, a, in a responsible and ethical way. The team that was behind the scenes in ensuring that we have a very successful press conference this morning. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the minister for his presence, support, and continued support for this project. This, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our event this morning. And of course, it could not have come at an appropriate time because today is the birthday of the University of the Vethas Rand. It turns 96. If in the last 96 years this university has made so many groundbreaking breakthroughs, opened up new vistas in how we understand ourselves as being human from the town skull, medical breakthroughs by Professor Tom Bothwell, medical uh, scientific breakthroughs in, in physics, engineering, because radar was co-invented here. So that was only in the last 96 years, Honorable Minister. So we are still warming up. The best is yet to come. You ain't said nothing yet. Thank you very much.